our species is unique. We are all members of a unique species which is privileged to understand for the first time in that 3,000 million year history why we are here. Richard, the question as we begin is, has science buried God? Well, which God? I mean, we could take Einstein's God, which is not really a personal God at all, but which is a sort of uh, poetic metaphor for the mystery, that which we don't understand about the universe. We could take a deist God, a sort of God of the physicists, a God of somebody like Paul Davies, who devised the laws of physics, God the mathematician, uh, God who put together the cosmos in the first place and then sat back and watched everything happen. Uh, and that would be, a, the deist God would be one that I think it would be, one could make a reasonably respectable case for that, not a case that I would um, accept, but I think it is a serious discussion that we could have. The third kind of God is one of which there are thousands and thousands of varieties, Zeus and Thor and Apollo and Amun-Ra and Yahweh. And uh, we don't actually need to go through all those because I've, um, as Larry has said, I've encountered John Lennox before and I know what he, the, the God he believes in, which is the Christian God. He believes that the creator of the universe, the God who devised the laws of physics, the laws of mathematics, the physical constants, who devised the parsecs of space, billions of light years of space, billions of years of time, that this paragon of physical science, this genius of mathematics, couldn't think of a better way to rid the world of sin than to come to this little speck of cosmic dust and have himself tortured and executed so that he could forgive himself. That is profoundly unscientific. Not only is it unscientific, it doesn't do justice to the grandeur of the universe. It's petty and small-minded. How do you explain the origin of the laws of physics? I do not know the origin of the laws of physics. Uh, what I do know is that whatever they are, it certainly doesn't help to propose that they were designed by a conscious intelligence, because that simply makes a bigger question than you've solved. Uh, it has been suggested that the laws of physics are extremely fine-tuned, and that if they were any different, the universe as we know it wouldn't exist, stars wouldn't exist, chemistry wouldn't exist, biology wouldn't exist, and we wouldn't exist. And theists are tempted to say, therefore, the laws of physics must have been designed in such a way that they are exactly fine-tuned to bring us into existence. Once again, that is a non-explanation because it leaves open the explanation for the designer. There are many physicists who uh, explain that by saying, well, with the so-called anthropic principle, saying that we could only exist in a universe which has the, the right laws and the right constants to bring us into existence. And therefore, the fact that we're talking about it determines that we must be in such a universe. That's the anthropic principle. Uh, there are versions of it which make it a bit more plausible. For example, the multiverse theory that there are lots of different universes, that we live in a kind of bubbling foam of universes, and each bubble in the foam has a different set of laws of physics. The vast majority of those laws of physics are not conducive to giving rise to us. A tiny minority are conducive to giving rise to advanced life forms. And once again, the anthropic principle comes in, we could only exist, we could only be in one of those bubbles that has the necessary laws of physics to bring us into existence. And therefore, obviously, since we do exist, since we're talking about it, we must be in such a universe. I haven't answered the question, but what I hope I have done is to show that whatever else the answer is, it cannot be God. There's a great deal that's mysterious about the universe, a great deal we don't understand, Rachel, we would love to understand, we want to understand, we're working on it. Having said all that, to give that a name, God, is a pure semantic trick. It doesn't help. It doesn't get you anywhere. The deistic God, although he doesn't interfere with human affairs, he doesn't listen to your prayers or forgive your sins, the deistic God, nevertheless, is a supernatural intelligence who designed the laws of physics 
designed the fundamental constants of physics and then stood back and let nature take its course. Nevertheless, he has to have been, at the outset of the universe, a supernatural creative intelligence. A supernatural creative intelligence has to be supremely complicated, elaborate, intelligent. It has to be exactly the kind of thing that we are trying to explain, trying to understand when we do science. You are shooting yourself in the foot if you say that God, even the deistic God, started it all. I'm a Darwinian biologist, and I come at this from a slightly different angle. Uh, the Darwinian enterprise, the problem which Darwin solved, was the problem of explaining life. Before Darwin came along, life was by far the favorite argument for the existence of some kind of divine creator. William Paley himself, author of Natural Theology, said, the physical world, the world of astronomy, is not best suited to demonstrate the creator. With the exception of Saturn's ring, he said, uh, there's not very much complexity out there. All the real complexity is in biology. All the real complexity is in things like eyes and elbow joints, which is why Paley devoted most of his book to biology. It was a stupendous problem. The very idea that you could explain the prodigious complexity of life, brains and kidneys and hearts and blood vessels, nervous systems, plants, chlorophyll, photosynthesis, hemoglobin, the very idea that you could explain such prodigies of complexity without any kind of supernatural supervision or design was an amazingly bold and seemingly impossible idea. No wonder no one thought of it before Darwin and Wallace came along. No wonder they just didn't bother to even con contemplate the possibility that there could be an explanation for such marvels of complexity and apparent design. Well, Darwin solved it. Darwin solved even that big problem of explaining life. And we haven't got a similar Darwin, we haven't got a similar explanation for the origin of the universe. Physicists like Dr. Lightman are working on it. And one day they may solve it, one day maybe they won't. But what I think is that the Darwinian success in solving the big problem should give us courage and say, if that could be done, if the human mind was capable, in the shape of Darwin and Wallace, capable of solving that big problem and showing that you don't need a designer, you don't need a creator, however wonderful the world may be, however wonderful life may be, you don't need a creator. That should inspire us to go on to the remaining, admittedly quite big problem of explaining where the laws of physics come from. What finally baffles me is the way our society, all of our society, has limply bought into the idea that faith should somehow be treated with exaggerated respect. As I said before, even secular individuals have come to accept the idea that faith should somehow be immune to criticism, simply because it is faith. Where you would gladly criticize somebody's political views or their artistic taste or their football team or their views on hunting or gun ownership or something like that, when it comes to faith, we are all expected to back off and say, no, no, we can't criticize faith. It isn't done. It's not good manners to criticize faith. Well, I think it's about time we started criticizing faith. The truth is, that without this convention of good manners which pervades our society, faith couldn't withstand criticism because it has no resources with which to do the withstanding. How can you defend a position when there are, by definition, no arguments in its favor? So my suggestion is that we should henceforth abandon our social convention of automatic respect for religious faith. Uh, with the recent Pew study showing that atheists and agnostics know more about religion and the Bible than, and holy books than believers. <laughs> uh, 
I, I suspect this did not uh, pass over your observational skills when that came out. Why do you suppose that is? Well, <laughs> yeah, I think there are two reasons. I mean, the, fir the first reason is that atheists and agnostics know more about everything. <laughs> <laughs> And the second reason is that <laughs> is that the more you know about religion, the more dopey you realize it is. So the results then you would say are a proxy for education or intelligence? Well, that was or? my first reason. But yeah. I think the other reason actually is probably true as well, because um, if people really, really read the Bible and saw what an utter horror story it is, um, <laughs> they wouldn't be so keen on it. I mean, um, they wouldn't base their morality on the Bible for a start. And I hope nobody here bases their morality on the Bible because if so, we're, we're in a bad way. I don't know where they get this idea that you're stride, <coughs> stride. <laughs> um, don't mince words, how do you really feel? No, I'm just kidding. No, 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 I mean, that, I mean, that is more or less undeniable if you actually look at, at what, the, what the Bible enjoins you to do. It's, in, it's utterly intolerable by, by modern standards. And of course, we get a, away from that by saying, oh, we don't believe that anymore. We've given up stoning adulteresses to death. Actually, not all parts of the world no. have given up stoning adulteresses to death. But we, in, at least in Christendom, have given up stoning adulteresses to death. So we've given that up. But it's cherry picking. You choose which verses of the Bible to give up and which verses to, to keep. So you might as well use whatever criterion you use for choosing and dispense with the Bible in the first place. You realize, don't you, that because in recent years you've devoted so much of your time to arguing the case against religion, that your obituaries are probably going to overlook your contributions to science, your development of the yes. counter, the phenotype, for example. Uh, are you happy about that? No, no I mean, it would, it would be a pity, I think. I mean, I actually don't see a great separation, and, I'd, and, and I, I, I regard science as beautiful, and what science finds as beautiful, the scientific method of thinking, as beautiful. And what I really want to do is to open people's eyes to the, to the, to the elegance and the beauty of the world as seen through scientific eyes, and if religion is a casualty of that, so much the better. In order for a life form to achieve an understanding of the universe, it has to have the right apparatus. And on our planet, that means a brain. When the brain has grown very large indeed, it becomes capable of comprehending the universe. And it does this by putting a model of the universe inside itself. But long before a brain can do that, it must grow up on its planet through intermediate stages. It serves an apprenticeship of setting up models of much more ordinary, mundane things. Brains never evolve for grand purposes like simulating the universe. Brains begin by simulating ordinary things like food or like the geography around your home. But our model of the universe will not be a little local model like this one. It will be a far grander undertaking. Building it is a shared enterprise. The model is distributed over the network of brains that are participating. Bits of the model are in books and libraries, pictures, computer databases. As time goes by and our civil civilization grows up more, the model of the universe that we share with one another will get better. It will become progressively more refined and more accurate in its mirroring of reality. And at the same time as we grow up, our shared model will become progressively less superstitious, less small-minded, less parochial. It will lose its remaining ghosts, hobgoblins, and spirits. It will be a realistic model, correctly regulated and updated by incoming information from the real world. A powerful model with parts that move relative to one another, a model capable of running on into the future and making accurate predictions of what's going to happen to us and our world. Only one species knows what it is made of, atoms belonging to a known list of elements, and it knows what atoms are made of, up quarks, down quarks, and electrons. 
Only one species knows how to discover such things, the scientific method which belongs to all humanity. Faint hearts find it a bleak and cold conclusion that we are machines made of atoms living finitely on a rock spinning around an ordinary star hanging in a vacuum in the suburbs of a galaxy, one galaxy among billions. But the universe owes us no comfort, and there is a savage nobility in standing up to face the truth. I cannot think of a better way to enjoy our transient brush with reality than to work at understanding it. Science is the poetry of reality, zenith of human achievement, jewel in our species crown. We, perhaps alone in the universe, are capable of finally growing up. Thank you very much.